how would you like to have repeat clients purchasing only digitals coming back to you multiple times per year? That's what your calendar can look like as a commercial pet photographer. Today's guest has a background in high level marketing and brand management and today uses that knowledge to successfully offer commercial pet photography. She shared all about what that entails, including creating briefs and charging. Uh, Plus, in the members extended episode, we covered charging for dog models, the impact of the need for videos for Reels and TikTok, and of course, marketing. We chatted for over an hour, and still I feel like we barely scratched the surface of what Rowan can teach you all about commercial photography. It's a huge topic, and so after the interview, I asked Rowan if she will deliver a live training to help you get started with offering profitable commercial photography, and I am stoked that she's on board. If you'd love to learn step-by-step how to win big brands, book local small businesses and understand things like usages and briefs, this is for you. The waitlist is open. Just head to thepetphotographersclub.com slash commercial to register your interest and you'll be first to find out more. For now though, let's just jump into this interview and hear all of what Rowan shared today because there is tons. Welcome to the Pet Photographers Club. Tune in as experts share their insights to help grow your business with higher sales, creative marketing, and kick arse business strategies. Now on to the show. Hello and welcome back to the Pet Photographers Club. I'm Kirsty McConnell and today I'm chatting with Rowan Williams of Pooch and Pineapple Dog Photography in the UK. Welcome to the club, Rowan. Hi, so good to be here. <laughs> so nice to have you here. We've been trying to do this since last year. I think it was uh, first I was sick and um, then the year got away, but finally we've uh, managed to jump on the call. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> no problem at all. Awesome. Um, so the reason I've been so keen to chat with you is because you're doing something quite different in your business to what we see across pet photography around the world, in fact, um, which is that you're actively going out and uh, marketing commercial photography for pet related businesses um, yep. on your, your dog photography website. So yeah. I see that it's listed there as like its own little portfolio or not little, but its own portfolio is listed as like, you know, find out, you know, book your shoot that it's split between two, between pet owners and pet business uh, photography. So I want to talk about that a little bit because I did realize after I did like a bit of digging, I found this site, I was like excited about what you're doing. And I learned that before photography, I think you were a brand manager or something. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So I have a corporate background, which is very, very dull and nowhere near as exciting as being a pet photographer. (laughs) Um, I was a brand manager um, for a pharmaceutical company and um, I started off in that business. I worked in sales for a little bit and then I I was very interested in marketing And then I went and did a qualification with the Chartered Institute of Marketing, which um, is a UK based uh, kind of like the gold standard of of marketing education. Lots of different um, education institutions will offer courses that are accredited by CIM. So, yeah, that's kind of if you're if you're a corporate marketer in the UK, then you generally get a qualification with the Chartered Institute of Marketing. I'd highly recommend them if anyone is like a big marketing nerd like me, because I really love their courses. <laughs> but I qualified with them and then I went and worked um, for the same drugs company. Actually, um, I worked in the UK as a product manager and then I lived abroad and worked in Brussels as a global marketing manager, like working very much on sort of brand strategy Uh, And then I came back to the UK and worked on a launch product, which was really interesting. Um, And then I got to 30 and thought, I need to have less stress and more fun in my life. I think I'll become self-employed because that's a really stressless lifestyle. (laughs) (laughs) You didn't quite get the memo, did you? No, I definitely did not. (laughs) 
<laughs> nice, nice. Okay, so I mean, that's quite a change. I mean, like a global brand management for a pharmaceutical company to micro pet photography business. I imagine when you actually first started out, it was uh, super, super tiny. And it actually, it wasn't pets that you first started with, was it? So maybe you just give a little brief overview of how you've gone from pharmaceuticals to photography and then uh, eventually niching down into, into pets as your primary offer now. Yeah, sure. So um, I actually started out shooting weddings and that was entirely by accident because I went and did a few photography courses and I kind of became friendly with a group of photographers who mainly shot weddings. And I wasn't really kind of interested in weddings at all because I really thought that they were sort of like that very sort of like cheesy 1990s style, big poofy wedding dress. Um, But actually, my friends in the wedding industry really opened my eyes to the fact that weddings can be pretty much anything anyone wants them to be. Um, And ordinarily, they're not that like 1990s style, sort of like Princess Diana, big poofy wedding dress. And yeah, so I started probably in 2008 shooting weddings and very much like niched into a very sort of like alternative wedding market and I shoot quite a lot of people who are getting married for the second time round or same-sex couples who are getting married um they generally tend to be getting married in sort of like quite alternative venues as well so that was really fun and I did really enjoy that because it's a lot of variation throughout the course of a day I found myself uh, having lots of clients that had dogs obviously as well which was wonderful um, but I was living down in London when I was doing that. And at the same time, I lived next to an animal rescue centre called the Mayhew Animal Home, uh, which your listeners in London will probably have heard of. And I used to volunteer with them and I worked right across their charity. So I would work in the kennels photographing their dogs, but then also in the cattery photographing the cats. Um, they have a veterinary clinic there as well. So I would photograph the vets, not just seeing the patients, but also scrubbing into theatre and photographing them actually working with their patients um, because they have a big training programme there for veterinary students. Um, and then they also have a an outreach programme as well into the community where they do education, but then they also do veterinary care and microchipping and spaying for um, homeless people who have pets as well. So that kind of opened my eyes to the variance of working with animals and how interesting that could be and I really enjoyed that very sort of like documentary approach Mm -hmm. um yeah so that's really kind of like what landed me into dog photography but then with the pandemic in 2020 that is definitely what forced me a little bit more um because I found it was it was I mean obviously it was stressful like for everybody but In March 2020, I think there was a space of a week where I had 25 wedding bookings just say, we're not going ahead this year. And it was utterly horrendous where my business basically just dried up overnight. So I was forced to look into other means of bringing in an income stream whilst events weren't able to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really kind of like focused a bit more on pets. And when the lockdown restrictions in the UK were lifted, was starting to do more pet photo shoots. And they were very casual as well to begin. It was kind of like just meeting up and going for a little walk and taking some nice photos. Um, So starting quite slowly. But then when obviously the UK lifted all the restrictions, which um, if my memory serves me correctly, was at the beginning of 2022. Um, it feels like a blur. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's hard to I, track, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it really is. Um, and then I found that I was shooting mainly pet stuff and actually I really enjoyed it. And um, at the moment, I'm still shooting my rescheduled weddings from 2020 here we are beginning of 2023 in the pandemic and its legacy still lingers on. And I have my last wedding from COVID uh, scheduled in August, 2024. And this year I'm probably only going to be shooting about five weddings. Um, And the bulk of my business is now pet photography. And um, specifically the bulk of my business is working with pet businesses, um, which suits me perfectly because I get to roll around with animals, which I love. 
Um, but then I also get to really be quite nerdy um, with my marketing and chat kind of like the commercial end of of image creation, which is exactly two things that I love. Yeah, well, and it also sounds like you have the perfect experience behind you as well, because not only, you know, do you understand the branding perspective because of your education and your experience in that field, but also, you know, you got started with pets by working with this uh, rescue organization where you were actually doing more uh, commercial kind of photos. I mean, when from what you're describing, I mean, when when we think of volunteer work for shelters or rescues, usually we're picturing like, you know, the, the portion that you mentioned that you do as well, but only that, which is yeah. um, the adopt the dogs for adoption, you know, or cats, you know, just yeah. the profile pictures and, and often it doesn't really go beyond that. But it sounds like you were really involved throughout the entire organisation in capturing all the different aspects, which is really what you're doing for now, commercial brands like pet photography, uh, sorry, pet business brands as well, right, the same style? Yeah, yeah, okay. totally that. So it was really about um, a documentary. And I remember when I was talking with the marketing manager at the Mayhew on that initial job, and uh, it was very clear in the brief that they wanted um, for every photo of an animal, there had to be a human in there as well. Mayhew really pride themselves on being an animal charity, but with a human focus. And they're very much about sort of like community outreach and the role that humans play in the care of animals. So all the images that I shot for them were of their kennel team kind of looking after the dogs or the cattery team looking after the animals like there was always a human in the photo um so it wasn't standalone fine art photos of the of the animals that were available for for adoption it was really documentary photography of what happens on the inside of the charity and how much that charity cares as well uh, which I absolutely loved. I, I just it was so interesting. Yeah, definitely I imagine it will be eye opening. So Let's use that as an example, actually, because you just mentioned the word brief, uh, the brief I received, which is probably something that most pet photographers, I think, would not have experience with that. So this um, organization that you're you're volunteering for, are you still uh, helping them out, Rowan? Uh, yeah, I do. Although I live in Sheffield now, so which is about two and a half hours on the train from London. So um, I don't get to go there as often as I would like to. Um, and I probably go twice a year and I spend a day with them and it's a real non-stop kind of day where I absolutely just, I mean, we don't even break for lunch. We just like keep on going and I've got a really tight time schedule to get around all the different stuff. But yeah, I've, I've, I've been with them for some time now and it's, it's, it's really emotional, like seeing how much they've grown as an organization and the kind of work that they're doing as well. Mm -hmm. I imagine. Okay, so um, when you first started uh, volunteering with the organisation, you mentioned that they gave you this uh, brief or there was a discussion of the brief. So just can we break that down a little bit and just discuss like what were the expectations? How did they deliver those to you? Did you have to draw it out of them? Or, you know, it sounds like it was, it's a pretty big uh, organisation, so perhaps there's <laughs> appropriate people to kind of work with this uh, work with you on it but yeah just give us a bit of an idea like how a big scale uh, project like this might might look yeah so the Mayhew were rebranding at the time so they were changing all of their logo and their website um, and they'd worked with a creative agency who had put together everything that you see so all the nice colors um, and the logo and really kind of like specifying what their what their organization was about and when I work with any pet business and it doesn't matter whether it's a small kind of like one person making stuff for dogs in their dining room table or whether it's a really really big brand I always start with tell me what your business is about so what is it that you do who is it for uh, what are the values attached to all of that so we, I have a good kind of like helicopter overview of what that business is about and, and what the brand encompasses. And then we get down into the nitty gritty of talking about, let's talk about exactly what kind of images you need. And very often, the smaller the business, I find they don't have a defined list or defined understanding of what it is that they need. So I need to do a little bit more legwork in terms of pulling that out of them and asking them the right questions to find out 
how they use images, um, where they use them, what kind of messages they they want to kind of like portray with, say, for example, their social media or on their website. Like what kind of feelings do they want to emote out of someone looking at the image? Um, and from that first initial meeting, what will what is then kind of comes out of that is a briefing document, um, which is just my way of writing everything down and just making sure that I completely understand what they're about and what they want to get out of working with me. Um, and that's pretty much what the brief is. Like one of the reasons why I love marketing so much is it's just about common sense and clarity. And I am someone who always really, really strives to find clarity in things. And I ask a lot of probably stupid questions, but you know, I just like to be really, really clear <laughs> about things. Well, no, I think it's important, isn't it? I mean, if you don't understand or you haven't grasped their vision or they haven't defined their vision yet, then how can you deliver a result that they're going to be satisfied with at the end of the day? So um, the more you ask, it makes sense to me. So, okay, it sounds like it's actually a lot of work on the at the beginning when you're first working with this client compared to working with a private client. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. So I um, I have a customer journey mapped out already and I tend to use roughly the same process for every single client, whether it's a local dog trainer or a really big brand that I'm working with. When they've decided that they want to go ahead and actually work with me, I issue them a contract and um, they pay a little deposit on my invoice as well to get the project started. And then I send them a little questionnaire. The questionnaire is questions from me that I, this is kind of like the the bones of the structure of the information that I need. Once that is completed, I'll kind of like start thinking about these are the kinds of shots that we might want to aim for during the shoot. And then we'll have a video call where we chat through everything. And I, and I just confirm my understanding and I give them some ideas and we kind of flesh those ideas out. I always stress to clients, it's a really collaborative process um, because I want to make sure that not only are they, are they benefiting from my expertise, but they're also kind of like playing with it and we'll, we'll get our minds bubbling together. And out of that meeting, what I generally then get is the shot list, which is, this is roughly what we're going to be aiming for. This is where we're going to shoot everything. These are the dogs that we're going to use. These are the products that we're going to use. These are the props that need to be pulled in. Um, and then yeah, from the, fr- from the shot list, then we have the production schedule of what's going to happen during the shoot. Well, okay. We have so much to break down from that. <laughs> I'm looking at the, there's like a little timer at the top of my screen and I'm like, holy moly, this is going to go over time. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, this is great. I mean, hopefully you've got time. So let's um, start at the beginning. So, or kind of the beginning. So you said at some point along there that you do all of this work. It's way more work than, or it is more work than working with a private client, at least in the beginning. You're finding out things like models and props and time scheduling and all of this kind of stuff before, you know, well and truly like at the beginning. But you also mentioned that uh, once they've decided that they're going to go ahead, they pay a deposit. So Mm -hmm. can you give us a bit of an idea? Like, how does that work? Are you quoting per job or is it like, you know, they pay like just a little bit to book the time and then they purchase per image? How does the pricing break down for you, Rowan? Um, So that's a really good question because I have recently changed my pricing structure and I was quoting on an hourly rate basis. Um, However, as I've done jobs on an hourly rate basis, what I found is that things always run over and the less organized the client is, the more it runs over. And I also find as well that when I deliver the images, what they want is a lot more images than what we initially talked about, which is mm-hmm. understandable. That's human nature. You know, they're seeing like a selection of their their baby, their, their their brand kind of like come to life. And of course you're going to want to be like, yeah, I want it all. It sounds great. <laughs> um, but just, I think to help clarify what's really important to them, 
but then also as well to protect my time and to put some boundaries around it as well. I now charge on a per image basis. And I find that that pricing structure has actually been easier for clients to understand from the outset. And it's also helped them to clarify their thinking as well. Um, So I'm definitely someone that likes a lot of feedback. I really kind of like thrive on external validation. So I constantly check in with clients throughout the process of, is this the right thing of what we're aiming for? Like, here's a shot list. Do you need more? Do you need less? Like, here's the first draft of all the images. Pick out the ones that you really love. Do you need more? Do you need less? And then finally, I kind of like take the draft images and then I go away and I do the retouch on them. And then the job is kind of like finalized and the bill is settled on the on the per image basis on the pricing. Um, And there's always like a like a little bit of variance as well. But I really try to kind of like help clients understand and prioritize what's super important in terms of what they want from the images rather than it just being like, Oh, I love all 100 images. I'll just have all of those. I'm like, cool. That's going to take me like two days to retouch. So (laughs) can you just be a bit more clear about things? And then, yeah, they figure it out. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So just to clarify then, once they see the images, they will decide on the final number of how many they're purchasing. But you mentioned they're paying a deposit. So in the beginning, are they paying like, you know, they've suggested, oh, we're probably, you've worked out together, we're probably going to need, say, 50 images. And so then you're paying them like, yeah, sorry, you're charging them a deposit based off that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So and one of the first questions I always ask clients as well is about their budget. Like, I, I always, like, I'm very clear as well. All my prices are on my website, by the way. If, if people want to go and see how much I charge, like, that's totally fine. I always ask clients right from the outset, so what kind of budget are we working with here? And I tend to like find the bigger the brand, the more clear they will be about that. So when I was a marketing manager, I knew like you have a specific budget already in mind for what it is you want to spend on a project. And it's just, it's just really helpful for creatives. I, I always found from a marketing manager's point of view, it was really helpful for creatives. If I say to them, I want to produce an ad campaign and I've got seven grand to spend, like, what can we do for that? And I, I tend to find that that's the way that my clients will roll with it as well. Um, for the smaller clients, like say, for example, a local dog trainer, um, there's usually a little bit more sort of like education on my side in terms of, okay, this is what you want to achieve, but this is what we can we can do with the money that you have because I want to be helpful for them and I want to make sure that they produce a set of images that they use time and time again and they get loads of value out of yeah okay that makes total sense so okay so they're paying a small deposit in the beginning and on average like what kind of deposit are you talking like a couple of hundred pounds or yeah usually so I um it's 25 percent of the kind of like the initial invoice and that's just to kind of get rolling with the planning they also sign a contract as well. Um, and the contract is basically, that's the, that's the order of work. Like that's the minimum that they've like signed up for that they're actually saying that they're going to do. So everyone is kind of like agreed to how much money is going to exchange. And I'm super clear as well, all the way on along the line about how much things will cost. Because I know from working working in marketing, like very often there's a brand manager and they are going back and they're having to justify their spending to an accountant. Or if they're a small business like a local dog trainer, then, you know, they're really watching the pennies just to make sure that they can actually keep a profitable business themselves. Mm. So I'm very transparent about these things. Um, I And I get feedback from people saying it's really helpful, actually, that they have that education because I have clients that say to me I really want to work with you and I love your work but we can't afford you at the moment and that's fine that's totally cool like you know there's a lead magnet on my website for them to sign up to so they can still get value from interacting with me but their business one day will be big enough for them to be able to pay to work with me and I love that idea Mm -hmm. yeah that's a really nice philosophy and you know Rowan actually on that note I think we might wrap up part one because it's a nice (laughs) and in part two I really want to dive even deeper into this like into you just mentioned like you know you want everyone to know exactly how much things are going to cost so I want to talk about that like what do you mean by that are you talking about like you know paying for models or props or this kind of thing I really want to get into that I want to get into 
the different options that you offer in terms of commercial, who you're kind of, yeah, where your income is coming from in terms of the client um, and yeah, whatever else, the comment, wherever else the conversation goes as well. So for now, um, yeah, let's wrap up part one. Otherwise I'm going to be keeping you here all day. Uh, but before we do that, how can the listener find you? What's the best place uh, for them to go? You mentioned the website earlier. Yep. So my website is www.poochandpineapple.com. I'm also on Instagram quite a lot. Um, and that is pooch n pineapple. Uh, that's my handle. I post that regularly quite there. There's quite a lot in my stories as well. There's quite a few blogs on my website as well that explain things to my clients about how I work and the kind of work that I do. So that's also worth looking at. Facebook as well. I'm pooch and pineapple on Facebook. And yeah, that's probably the main places where I show up at the moment. Okay, perfect. I'll pop links um, to all of those in the show notes anyway. So uh, if you did miss any of those guys, just jump over to the show notes. You can just head to thepetphotographersclub.com slash the dash podcast and search Rowan and uh, you will find all the notes uh, on that episode. Now, uh, don't forget that if you're a member of the club, you can jump on over to your member zone or the RSS, a private RSS feed to continue listening to the rest of this episode, which from what I'm getting so far is um, definitely going to be full of some gold. So make sure you go and have a listen to that. If you're not a member yet, of course, you can join today. It's just 10 bucks a month. Um, membership includes tons of perks like hearing the end of this episode and discounts to online workshops and uh, most of the resources that we have for sale on the website as well. So um, head on over to the petphotographersclub.com slash join if you do want to join us. Um, but otherwise, uh, that's it uh, for today. Thanks so much for uh, joining uh, the listeners for part one, uh, Rowan, and we'll continue this conversation in just a second. Thanks for listening to the Pet Photographers Club. To subscribe to the podcast, check out other episodes, and keep up to date, head to thepetphotographersclub.com.